Welcome, let's uh, sit down and have a chat about Medusa, shall we? So for those who don't already know me, my name is Jean Mingus and I'm an author and an ancient historian. And today, as I've already mentioned, I want to talk a little bit more about Medusa. And I'd love to know what pops into your head as soon as I say that name. Perhaps you can let me know in the comments before you've even watched the rest of this video. What do you think of when you think about Medusa? What image springs to mind? What characteristics do you associate with that name? What other names come to mind with Medusa's story? And perhaps even what media and modern pop culture do you picture? Because Medusa is a character of Greek and Roman mythology who has been depicted endlessly. For somebody who actually has limited references to her name in the ancient material, she's someone that's really, really captured the imagination of subsequent generations. And that's not to say that there aren't a number of references to Medusa and that gorgons don't appear in ancient art and ancient literature, but there are monsters or women or mythical beings or gods or goddesses who come up a lot more who we don't see depicted visually in art and media or in literature in the 21st century as often as we do Medusa. And I think we will talk a little bit about some of the reasons why that might be in this video. We'll also be looking at how Medusa has changed over the millennia, looking back at some of the earliest references to her, the variations in her story in antiquity itself, because they are not consistent, as is the case for every single, or at least 99% of Greek and Roman mythology. And then tracing how that image has changed, remained consistent, or been reinterpreted throughout time, and in particular during the 20th and 21st century, because I imagine those are the Medusas, because there are many that we are all most familiar with. So the earliest reference to the character of Medusa actually comes in a poem by the poet Hesiod called the Theogony. Now this is a ancient Greek poem that recounts the birth and different generations of many of the different ancient Greek gods and it doesn't have an exact date but roughly the late 8th early 7th century is when most scholars put it. Now that might already give you a hint as to who Medusa's parents are because this is the story of the god and the goddesses and their children. And it's when Hesiod is recounting the children of Forkes and Keto that he includes Medusa in their numbers. So the translation here reads, she bore the Gorgons who lived beyond famed Oceanus at the world's edge hard by night, where the clear voiced Hesperides are, Stethno, Uriel and Medusa who suffered a grim fate. She was mortal, but the other two immortal and ageless, and with her, the god of the sable locks, lay in a soft meadow among the spring flowers. And when Perseus cut off her head from her neck, out sprang great Chrysor and the horse Pegasus. And that is, in effect, a very succinct summary of one of the major versions of Medusa's myth. So what you can see here is that Medusa is a Gorgon, and in this earliest account, of her story, she's always a Gorgon. She is the child of a god and a goddess. She is one of three Gorgons who are mythical creatures alongside her two sisters, Thethno and Uriel. She is, however, always different. So even in this version, this early version where she is born a Gorgon, she's not the same as her sisters. And this might be one of the reasons why you see in some later versions, she's depicted as being born a mortal woman and turned into a Gorgon because it's almost difficult to marry up the fact that she was a mortal and a Gorgon at the same time while her sisters were immortal and Gorgons. Um, it doesn't go into detail in this version as you heard but when you do see Gorgons depicted in art including very early art from the archaic period they have these wings and tusks and snakes for hair so we cannot really say one way or another whether the mortal Gorgon Medusa had those features, some of those features or not in this version but she is certainly mortal and she can die which you see happen 
in this version. She is slain by the hero Perseus. Now, this version obviously doesn't go into much detail about why or how Perseus slays Medusa. There's also no reference to the fact that she can supposedly turn humans to stone with the glance of her eyes. So very bare bones as I mentioned, but there is a reference to something which becomes quite pivotal later on in Medusa's myth and that is the incident in which she lays with, as it's described here, the god Poseidon. So it's translated here as sable locks, I've seen it translated as dark haired, but whichever it is, the Greek itself is a common phrase used to refer to Poseidon. So it's definitely Poseidon we're seeing here, and it is very unclear from this version whether this is a consensual relationship or not. There's really no firm indication one way or another. You could, however, interpret it as non-consensual because of the earlier reference in the passage which describes her as suffering a grim fate. Now that could obviously refer to her death, it could refer to um, a sexual assault, it could refer to both. We have no indication in this early version what it refers to but as you will see and as you might be familiar with later versions do depict Medusa's encounter with Poseidon as a sexual assault. So that might be what we're seeing here but it's very difficult um, to confirm based on the text only and this is one of only two references to Medusa's encounter with Poseidon that we even have in ancient literature, the only other one explicitly depicts it as a sexual assault. So it's probably worth mentioning here that there is no right or wrong version of an ancient myth, particularly when you're talking about what the ancients believed, because they continuously changed and transformed even slightly but sometimes quite radically over the decades and the centuries and they could even vary depending on where you were in Greece or Italy or elsewhere in the Mediterranean. So there's not to say there's one right version, but as the sexual assault is such a major feature of the most in-depth version of Medusa's myth that we have, I think it's worth noting here that we have an allusion to that in this earlier version. Now the most in-depth, the longest version of Medusa's myth that I have already alluded to actually comes from a Latin text. So this is Ovid's Metamorphosis, which is an epic poem composed by Ovid that recounts various incidents of metamorphoses in Greek myths. So, you know, creatures turning into other creatures, men and women turning into plants and trees, people turning into animals, what have you. It's all about transformation. And Medusa's story is included in there because we see a transformation take place in this lengthy version of her story. So the greater part of Ovid's narrative actually focuses on the hero Perseus's adventures, including um, his quest to slay Medusa, the Gorgon monster. And in doing so, he discusses why it was Medusa he slayed, what happened to her, why she was the way she was. And what we hear is that one man asks Perseus why she alone of her sisters wore that snake twined hair. So we've already got the implication there that this is not a general Gorgon feature, this is something unique to Medusa in this version. And Perseus answers, what you ask is worth the telling. Listen and I'll tell the tale. Her beauty was far famed, the jealous hope of many a suitor, and of all her charms her hair was loveliest. So I was told by one who claimed to have seen her. She, it said, was violated in Minerva's shrine by Ocean's lord. Jove's daughter turned away and covered with her shield her virgin's eyes, and then for fitting punishment transformed the Gorgon's lovely hair to loathsome snake. Minerva still, to strike her foes with dread, upon her breastplate wears the snakes she made. So you pick up other little tidbits of Medusa's story and the um, stories surrounding her in this text, but one of the most striking features and one that's been most heavily discussed and adapted is the sexual assault against Medusa by Poseidon and her punishment by, in this version, Minerva because it's the um, Roman text, but who would be the equivalent of the Greek Athena. So the sexual assault is said to have happened in one of Athena's temples. This offends Athena and therefore Athena punishes Medusa because she is sexually assaulted. It's a very horrific myth. It really is the definition of victim blaming and I think it's very difficult to read and digest um, as somebody who's interested in mythology or reading about Greek myths, which is also why I think there has been an interesting modern 
reinterpretation of that story in which Athena is almost painted as a saviour of Medusa. There is a very modern interpretation that you'll see a lot in discussions online around Medusa and Athena, particularly from those who are big fans of Athena um, as one of the most powerful female goddesses. I get the appeal, which is that after Medusa was assaulted by Poseidon, Athena wanted to do something to help Medusa protect herself in the future, wanted to give the Gorgon extra powers and therefore turned her hair to snake and presumably gave her this power to turn men to stone, which you also see mentioned in this version. Now that interpretation, I have to say, has no real basis in the ancient evidence. I'm not against people creating and adapting mythology, uh, but I think it's really important to bear in mind whether something is an ancient version or not. And there's really nothing to suggest that and in Athena's characterization throughout mythology she is quite vindictive as are all the gods or goddesses it's not something unique to her but they quite often punish others um, for not having done anything wrong they punish mortals when they can't punish other gods and goddesses and there's really nothing out of character for Athena doing this horrific thing she's also a goddess who in a lot of ways exemplifies ancient Greek patriarchy <laughs> she very much upholds the patriarchal status quo within myth I don't think there's really anything to suggest that interpretation from the ancient evidence but it is something that I thought I would mention that people have um, sort of come up with as a modern version and here it's also worth mentioning that this isn't the only book that talks about Athena punishing um, or harming Medusa. Something similar is also a feature of Apollodorus's version of the myth in his Bibliotheca or commonly translated into English as the Library of Greek Mythology. So this is a Greek text but it's a later Greek text written during the Roman Empire and in this text he once again recounts the adventures of Perseus including um, his murder of Medusa. Let's just call it what it is. It's not really like she provoked him in any way. Um, and he mentions the Gorgons who, notably in his version, are asleep <laughs> when Perseus comes to kill them. I always think that's um, interesting and it is something about um, heroes and heroines in Greek mythology and Roman mythology. They're not always necessarily like morally wonderful and fantastic, but Perseus does kill Medusa in her sleep, which is interesting in this version. So he mentions the Gorgons and their names were Seth, No, Uriel and Medusa who we've already heard. Only Medusa however was mortal and for that reason it was her head that Perseus was sent to fetch. So we're given a reason here as to why it's Medusa that of all the Gorgons Perseus is sent to kill because he can. The Gorgons had heads with scaly serpents coiled around them and large tusks like those of swine and hands of bronze and wings of gold which gave them the power of flight and they turned all who beheld them to stone. So Perseus stood over them as they slept, and while Athene guided his hand, he turned aside and looking into a bronze shield in which he could see the reflection of the Gorgon, he cut off her head. As her head was severed, Pegasus, the winged horse, and Chrysor, the father of Geryon, sprang from the Gorgon's body. She had conceived them previously by Poseidon. So Perseus placed Medusa's head in the wallet and as he was making his way back the Gorgon started from their sleep and tried to pursue him but they were unable to see him because of the cap which hid him from their view which is a reference um, to a cap of invisibility which Perseus is wearing in this version of the myth. Now you will note that the children of Medusa who are born in the moment of her death are the children of Poseidon. There's literally no indication here as to whether they had a consensual or non-consensual relationship in this text. Now in between all of this, Perseus then carries on on his journeys, he gets married, it all goes swell for him and he even uses the severed head of Medusa to turn others to stone. So she's weaponized in her death. This um, head that's no longer alive, that's decapitated, becomes a weapon of Perseus. But it does then later in the same text mention that Hermes returned the aforesaid objects to the nymphs and Athena fixed the Gorgon's head to the centre of her shield. But there are some who say that Medusa lost her head because of Athene, for they say that the Gorgon had claimed to rival the goddess in beauty. So not necessarily an incident in which Athena turned Medusa into a Gorgon, but an incident in which Athena played a part in encouraging or helping Perseus to kill the Gorgon Medusa because her beauty had been said to rival Athena's. Again, there is a lot of this kind of like jealousy and um, vitriol within Greek mythology everywhere. So there are a few things in those texts I also haven't touched upon in terms of the myths 
themselves. One is the fact that Medusa becomes a part of Athena's shield and you'll see this in artistic depictions of Athena all over the shop. It's that snake-headed gorgon head of Medusa on the shield and it's something really really common in Greek and Roman art. I also haven't touched upon the fact that she gave birth to two children as she died. So one of the things that is part of Medusa's myth is that she was impregnated by Poseidon and when Perseus cuts off her head, from this act of violence, from the blood, is born the two children that were inside her at this moment in time. One of which is actually the horse Pegasus and I always think it's really interesting when you, you learn this fact, I remember finding it really interesting when I learned this fact, because a lot of us might think that Pegasus was made out of a fluffy cloud by Zeus as a gift for Hercules if we've been watching the Disney film too many times, but in fact Pegasus was actually born from Medusa. Medusa was Pegasus's mother and he was born in this moment of real violence along with his brother. Now Chrysor is a little bit more unpredictable than his sibling because sometimes he appears as a man in art, sometimes he appears as a winged boar. It is um, changeable, <laughs> shall we say. So those are the children of Medusa and Poseidon that are born from, as I mentioned, this moment of violence. So hopefully now you feel a little bit more familiar with like the main narrative events surrounding Medusa's life. We have a mortal but a gorgon who has two sisters who sometimes share her snake hair, sometimes don't, who is sometimes assaulted by Poseidon, other times it's not mentioned, who is sometimes punished by Athena, again sometimes it's not mentioned, and is then ultimately beheaded by the hero Perseus and gives birth to two children. So whatever version you're following, it always kind of ends up a pretty raw deal for Medusa, I have to say. And yes, she can turn humans to stone, which is pretty dangerous, not a great thing to be out there in the world, but there's no indication in the sources that she was out there purposefully using this power. She wasn't running rampant or rampaging the land, turning everyone to stone and making everyone's lives miserable. In fact, she lives on an island with her two sisters, very reclusively, away from most people and outside of the everyday world. The reason Perseus is sent to slay her isn't because of the danger she poses, it's because his uncle wants to send him on a life-threatening mission, which is its whole own story. That's why Perseus goes to slay her. It's not to save the world. It is to save his mother, but it's at the whim of a pretty nasty old man. So, yeah. Now, there are some further variations on Medusa's story, though. In fact, almost entirely separate stories themselves that really bear no resemblance to the incidents I've just shared with you. And you'll find this a lot with Greek and Roman myth in particular because we have so many texts <laughs> from the ancient Mediterranean that give us insight into these myths that there can be some real different versions of things and this is one of them because you'll actually find that there is a more historicized version of Medusa's myth in some later texts. So specifically both Pausanias and Diodorus Siculus attribute the Gorgon race to Libya. They identify the Gorgons as a race of women who live, were born um, and occupied ancient Libya. And in these versions, Gorgon almost becomes more of a term for their people than it necessarily does for a mythical beast or creature. And there are far more of them than just the three that you hear named in the other texts. But Medusa is sometimes one of those named Gorgons. Specifically in Pausanias, Medusa is actually the leader of her own army and hunting party. She almost has an Amazon-like quality about her. But because she's not a mythical beast, there also has to be an explanation for Perseus's murder of the Gorgon. So in Pausanias's version, Perseus is simply a, another soldier who sneaks into Medusa's encampment one evening and kills her because he's so mesmerized by her beauty that he wants to take her head away and always keep it with him because he really, really fancies her. So it is a, a act of 
sexual aggression, it's an act of sexual violation if we think about his motivations in this version, um, but it's not one in which her head can turn people to stone. Meanwhile, Diodorus Siculus actually depicts the Gorgons and the Amazons warring against one another. So we have two races of female warriors in his historicised version of this myth, and Medusa is one of their queens or leaders, but it's after her death that the Gorgon people, empire, kingdom, queendom, whatever you want to call it, falls. So that's her only reference in his version of events. So pretty radically different, which just goes to show already the diversity of Medusa's story, but still there are these consistent themes, characters and names that crop up. And it doesn't end in antiquity, these variations. We continue to see Medusa become this popular figurehead of storytelling, of art, um, that has, you know, appeared in some of the greatest paintings of all time, as well as television shows and children's books and video games. She is everywhere and that's what I want to talk a little bit more about now, how Medusa's image has changed over the years and actually how she's almost become less of a complex character than she is in ancient myth, how she's become a trope, how she has become quite one-dimensional in many incidents, but then even still how now in the 21st century there has been an attempt to reclaim her narrative, to look at, to re-examine what happened to her, how it might reflect certain important themes, cultural issues and social issues that we're discussing now and how perhaps her depictions in say 20th century media really did her dirty. So before we get to the 20th century, it's worth noting that Medusa never entirely goes away. She's never absent from popular culture? I don't know if you can call Renaissance paintings popular culture, but like the art of the time. And she's actually a popular subject of paintings throughout the 15, 16, 17 and 1800s. One of the most iconic images of Medusa is perhaps Caravaggio's painting from the 1500s, which mimics the shield idea that we referenced earlier, where Medusa is in the centre of this circular object. But she's much more human-like. She has this very human face, in contrast with the ancient depictions of Athena's shield and the Gorgon head, which I'll put up on the screen for contrast with you, where she seems much more monstrous. She doesn't look like a human, or the Gorgons in general don't look like humans in these depictions. They're almost cartoonish in some ways, and Caravaggio, in contrast, depicts a very human woman but with these snakes for hair. Meanwhile, we see a similarly human face with snakes for hair decapitated and lying on the sand depicted by Paul Rubens in his painting from the 17th century and one of the most iconic more recent sculptural depictions of Medusa is definitely that of Benvenuto Cellini from the 1500s which depicts the hero Perseus nude very much in the ancient Greek style of sculpture holding up the severed head of Medusa. Again, very human-like face, but then representing the monstrous simultaneously because this sculpture feels very much as though it's depicting a victorious hero who has slain a monster, who's done something brave and incredibly admirable. But we have this very human head and it's really interesting that you see in a lot of the art from this period that Medusa is both a monster who represents victory over like the inhuman, who re represents the sort of strength of ancient heroes, but is actually given a more human face than you often see her decapitated head as being depicted in ancient art, which I do think is an interesting contrast and it probably has a lot to do with styles of art from this time, as well as an obsession with Medusa's beauty, which you see referenced often in the ancient texts as well, but don't necessarily see depicted in the ancient art. Aside from the idea of the victorious hero defeating the Gorgon monster, if you'd like an even more wild interpretation of the Medusa myth and our obsession with the Medusa myth, you need only look to Freud, because who else gives us the most fascinating interpretations of ancient mythology other than Freud? As you can probably tell, I definitely don't follow the Freudian school of thought myself, but he has some 
interesting things to say. So when it comes to Medusa, he talks about the decapitation as a symbol for castration. So this quote reads that the terror of Medusa is thus a terror of castration that is linked to the sight of something. Numerous analysis have made us familiar with the occasion for this. It occurs when a boy who has hitherto been unwilling to believe the threat of castration catches sight of the female genitals, probably those of an adult, surrounded by hair and essentially those of his mother. Oh Freud, <laughs> you're consistent if nothing else, but he really goes down his own tangent and route when it comes to interpreting the myth of Medusa and our obsession with it. I'll let you sit with that and do with it what you will. Then fast forward to the 20th century, the era of cinema, and we see an upsurgence in Medusa's depiction. The Medusa that a lot of us think about today is an image that's actually been conjured by the 20th century and I very much mean visually because as many of you know it's very common to depict Medusa or imagine Medusa with a snake's tail. So not just snakes in her hair but the body of a snake and you can see this as far as like modern media and modern toy collections if you look at the Funko Pop Gorgon or the Lego Gorgon Medusa they have snake tails and, and you see it a lot in media it's something that you've probably encountered if you've encountered Medusa but it's something that literally did not exist as far as I can tell in my research until the 20th century in fact the earliest depiction of Medusa with a snake tail that I'm familiar with and and that's not to say that actually snake-tailed women are not a large part of mythologies from around the world. You see it across mythologies, you see it in Mama Dlo, who's from Trinidad and Tobago, you see it in Melusine, who's from France, but you don't see it in Medusa in the original sources. You don't see it at least until Clash of the Titans. So Clash of the Titans was a 1981 film with special effects by Ray Harryhausen who also did the special effects for Jason and the Argonauts. They are incredible for their time, they are so pivotal in the history of cinematic special effects that these films are just so worth watching for that alone. Um, perhaps not for their accuracy to the ancient mythology but also just for their entertainment value I would highly recommend them. But the Medusa we see in Clash of the Titans is something else because we actually see the return of her monstrous face. She really doesn't resemble a human in any way shape or form. She is a serpentine monster. She has a snake's tail instead of legs, she has a snake's tongue, she has a scaled body, she's green, she is the Funko Pop Medusa. And for me at least, this is the moment when Medusa becomes condensed to a one-dimensional monster from Greek mythology. She is no more complex than a very, very scary snake as far as I can see when it comes to Clash of the Titans. And it really feels like this is the moment when she's cemented in pop culture as a monster. Sure there's hints at it earlier and during the Renaissance period she seems to be the symbol of the victorious hero defeating um, the Gorgon but it's really not until this moment that for me she becomes so one-dimensional as she does in this film and that's not to say it's not a fantastic special effect <laughs> but it's had a real lasting effect on our perception of Medusa, especially in media. Although there is another really interesting use of Medusa as a monster that I find really interesting that comes from 1980 and it's not a visual depiction of her but it's the use of her as a metaphor in the song Madame Medusa by the UK reggae band UB40 and in this song Medusa is actually used as a metaphor for Margaret Thatcher so if you know much about the history of the UK in the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher was devastating the country. She was destroying lives everywhere she went and from the comfort of her own home on a daily basis. So there was certainly good reason for UB40 to despise her so, but it's really interesting that they chose to use Medusa as a metaphor for someone who I personally think is far more monstrous than Medusa and did a lot more damage than Medusa ever did in mythology, but in real life. If you're not familiar with UB40, however, and do recognise the name Madame Medusa, that might be because you've seen the 1977 Disney film The Rescuers, where Madame Medusa is the villain. She is a mortal human woman, but 
perhaps that use of the name Medusa is meant to emphasise her monstrosity. So it's very, very clear that by the 20th century, Medusa is this metaphor for a monster. She is the metaphor for the monstrous feminine uh, in particular. And that image has remained. She has carried on in this form into the 21st century, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in detail. So while you may not have seen the 1981 version of Clash of the Titans, you may have seen the 2010 version of the film starring Sam Worthington, the lead of Avatar. Now, while in this version of the Clash of the Titans, Medusa keeps the snake's tail, so she's still in the image or in the design of the original Clash of the Titans, the upper half of her body becomes much more humanoid. In the 2010 film she is both this creature of fear and allure simultaneously. These two things start to become one and the same. They become married up in Medusa's character. Meanwhile in the Odyssey installment of the Assassin's Creed video game from 2018 she is one of the monsters that you have to defeat and not only can she turn you to stone but she also has the power of force field which is definitely an addition by the game developers but She's also one of the most difficult monsters to defeat in the game, so like, hats off to them, give Medusa some power, even if she is a demon and a villain. If we really want to hammer home the idea of this simultaneously seductive and dangerous femme fatale version of Medusa, however, we need only look to Percy Jackson. Now, I have a great deal of respect for Rick Riordan and his Percy Jackson series. It's gotten a ton of kids and adults into Greek and Roman mythology. They are a ton of fun, but I do somewhat hold against him his depiction of Medusa. And this is why. So not only is Medusa the villain of the first instalment in this series, she is a monster, she's the villain, she's the one that needs defeated, she's evil to the core. But on top of this, it's actually the son of Poseidon who is the hero of the story. Percy Jackson is the son of Poseidon. And that's not to say that this film or this book glorifies Poseidon um, as a god or paints him as perfect. But you're seeing the son of the man who in some versions of her ancient myth assaults her, become the righteous hero that also defeats her, which is particularly tragic. And then on top of that, you see Uma Thurman, for example, in the film adaptation, reference the fact that she used to date Poseidon. Son of Poseidon. I used to date your daddy. So basically that complex relationship that in some instances refers to a sexual assault in the ancient evidence um, and is never explicitly consensual at least in the ancient evidence becomes the story of a woman scorned from a dating history where she is the ex-girlfriend of this god and I always think it's a little bit of a shame that the Medusa of ancient myth becomes what she does in the Percy Jackson series. I do think she was done a little bit of a disservice in my personal opinion. Now I could just continue to list incidents in which Medusa or the Gorgons are used as villains or monsters in pop culture, they appear on the show Supernatural and they're always the bad guy. But that's not to say there are not alternative versions of Medusa out there. So interestingly enough, in terms of just a more neutral use of Medusa's image, her face has actually become the logo for the designer fashion brand Versace. So you may have seen this logo out and about, perhaps not in person, perhaps online. But back in 1978, Gianni Versace decided that Medusa would be the face of his brand. And the logo itself is actually quite in keeping with the ancient depictions of Medusa and the Gorgons in art, which I think is really interesting. But then in terms of the symbolic inspiration, um, Versace is quoted as apparently having used Medusa because she made people fall in love with her and they had no way back. Now this is really interesting because there's literally nothing to support this in the ancient evidence. This is entirely a, a modern idea. It's not even one I'm actually super it's not even one I can pinpoint an origin to, other than the fact that throughout media you either see Medusa depicted as the quintessential scary snake-like monster or a femme fatale. She's never particularly admired, she always has an ulterior motive in popular culture, but she's a sexy monster is basically what she is. Um, when it comes down to it, she's one or the other or she's both at the same time. And this is really the only 
basis that I myself can see for Versace's interpretation, but it's really interesting that that's who he chose, therefore, to go with the branding for his entire, you know, um, company. <laughs> and it just goes to show actually how myths and mythical characters can really take on a life of their own. And versions of these characters be can become very widely accepted in the same way that there's lots of people who argue for the sympathetic Athena who saved Medusa from further violence, but that have no rooting in the ancient versions that have very much come out of modern adaptations, modern ideas, and perhaps in response to all of this, both the um, diluting of Medusa's story, the one-dimensionality she's almost given in um, the late 20th century, early 21st century, we are starting to see more women writers reclaim that story and the themes of that story. And in fact, it's not actually just women because one of the most sensational images of Medusa um, to get attention in the past sort of decade or so was a sculpture created by Italian artist Luciano Garbati. Now, as you can probably see from images that I'm hoping are currently on the screen, this sculpture is explicitly a reversal of the 16th century Benvenuto Cellini sculpture that I mentioned earlier where Perseus holds the severed head of Medusa. And in this scene, we see Medusa holding the severed head of Perseus. And because of the subversive nature of this piece that really asks us to question who the good guys and the bad guys are, particularly in the original dynamic of the myth, this sculpture ended up taking Twitter by storm in 2018 during the rise of the hashtag MeToo movement. And you might have seen it do the rounds on social media yourself, but it became quite a visual symbol of that movement because of what it depicted and what it symbolised. And this reclamation can also be seen in 21st century literature. So there are a great number of myth retellings which focus on Medusa's story. And I'm just going to focus on three here that I really think encompass the different elements of that story and the different themes and why it's perceived as relevant to today. The first one is the earliest one, which is Hear the World Entire by Anne Wynne Hayward. And this is an adult novella from the perspective of Medusa after her transformation, after she is punished by Athena. And it's very much rooted in the Ovidian version, the version from Ovid's Metamorphosis, as are most retellings these days, because it probably has the most detail, it has the most full and complete narrative of Medusa's life specifically. And in fact, on top of that, because it touches on subjects so close to home for many of us, in terms of sexual violence and victim blaming and the the effects and emotional trauma that carry on through when these things happen. And that is something that Hear the World Entire in particular perfectly captures. It is a very emotive book which very, very much focuses on Medusa's personal trauma. And it is effectively a deep dive on a very modern timeless emotion that many of us will experience in our lifetimes, one that will have existed in antiquity but that didn't necessarily get the time to be explored in the texts of antiquity. It's not like we have texts written by countless women of their own feelings from antiquity so we can't experience that firsthand but it's imagining based on what the author knows herself of trauma to potentially have been this character's own feelings given what happened to her in Ovid's version. And it's very, very emotive and it's very, very beautifully written. Then more recently, Jessie Burton actually picked up this narrative for a YA novel, an illustrated YA novel, which combines the popularity of Medusa in physical art and written art, and really beautifully, I have to say. And for me as a reader and as a writer, I really appreciate that Jessie Burton touched on this story for young adults and for teenagers in particular because the themes of the sexual violence episode are something that are still thematically relevant to young people. And again, this book looks at the trauma experienced by Medusa, but it's also a book with an underlying element of hope that I think really considers its demographic and its audience and who might be reading it and looking at the fact that Medusa 
although affected by what happens to her is so much more than what happens to her. It's really really beautifully written and again like I mentioned accompanied by some really beautiful illustrations. Now this video obviously is in in-depth book reviews of any of these specific titles but if you are interested more in Medusa and Jessie Burton's experience writing Medusa I did interview her on my podcast That's Ancient History so I will link that episode down below but one of the things I really wanted to focus on when it came to Jessie Burton's Medusa is the ending. Now spoiler alerts for the next 60 seconds or so I am going to talk about what happens at the end of this book but really really interestingly Jessie Burton changes the myth. She doesn't do a straightforward retelling in which Medusa is slain by Perseus as is depicted in pretty much every single ancient version of her story, she actually depicts Medusa escaping and that very much underlines that message of hope. Then most recently I'm sure many of you are aware of Natalie Haynes, most recent Greek myth retelling Natalie Haynes has a few Greek myth retellings out now including Stone Blind which is a retelling of Medusa's story but it's actually not entirely about Medusa or entirely from Medusa's perspective. This book touches on almost every single mythological character that has any tie to Medusa's story, whether they meet her or not, they may be tangentially connected to three other characters, they may have even lived in a slightly different era from Medusa, but it emphasises the way in which all Greek and Roman mythology is very intertwined and you get the perspectives of Perseus and Sethno and Uriel and Athena who are some of the names I've already mentioned numerous times in this video and it's really really effective at touching on all of the very many different elements of Medusa's story and almost managing to marry up every variation. <laughs> it's quite impressive in fact how it manages to rationalise all the variations in one place but at the same time kind of point out how you know some people believe this and some people believe that and we're never really going to get a firm answer either way because that is the nature of myth it is ever changing and it's one that I think if you're a little familiar with Medusa's myth as I would think you would be from this video you'll really enjoy jumping into now and um, because you'll have that background and understand um, a lot of the references within it because it is quite a like deep dive on the story. But what all three of the books I just talked about with you do is reclaim a narrative about a woman who is assaulted in versions of her myth and who has never before really had a chance to explore the trauma of that assault and who many of us may see a relatable figure reflected in and she is given a voice in these books, she is given a chance to explore her own emotions and the authors are also given a chance to explore very important contemporary issues like I said victim blaming and harassment and rape and it's really expertly done and it shows how the timeless nature of mythology carries on and how each new generation focuses on different themes from the myth and extracts new elements of the myth as significant and analyses new elements of a myth that's been around for millennia but continues to be popular and how even though it never went away it never necessarily had for example the trauma explored before now which I think is incredible and it's very much a part of a general resurgence in literature and retellings to look at the perspective of women and explore their trauma because there's a lot of it in Greek and Roman mythology. And meanwhile post Percy Jackson we're actually also starting to see a change in the depiction of Gorgons in children's media which I really really like because it's really nice to see um, both Medusa and just like the Gorgon species in general given new layers of complexity and have this monstrous image challenged or at least have them become much more three-dimensional and layered and by that I am of course referencing sing Monster High. So Monster High is um, a media line and a toy line for children which includes dolls, web series and now a live action film and one of the main characters in this world is Juice Gorgon and Juice Gorgon is actually the son of Medusa. Now while Medusa herself isn't a main character in the world of Monster High her son is and while some of you may say this is children's media and it's not that deep I actually think it's really really 
really interesting how juice is depicted in this world, particularly in the most recent 2022 Generation 3 incarnation, because he is perceived as a monster and Gorgons are perceived as a monstrous, troublesome race, even in this monstrous world. But he has decided to show another side of himself and to combat some of these stereotypes and misconceptions surrounding Gorgons, which Again, maybe it's not that deep, but it feels a little bit like a reflection of the way media in general is starting to treat the Gorgon race and Medusa as well. And I really, really like that. I really liked Juice as a character in the live action film. And I like that he is as much a hero as any of the other monsters. So much so you can even buy yourself a Juice Gorgon doll because he is included in their lineup of new Generation 3 dolls. And Juice isn't actually the only Gorgon available on the toy market, or at least he isn't the only one to have been available in the past few years because as I've already mentioned, you can see Gorgons and Medusa in the Funko Pop lines, you can see them in Lego, two incredibly, incredibly popular toy franchises. And even Barbie, like the OG fashion doll that everybody recognises, created a collector's Medusa doll a few years ago as part of a goddess line that they were producing. And it's interesting that they chose Medusa because realistically, in terms of antiquity. Medusa was not a goddess, not in the same way as Athena or um, Aphrodite, who are two of the other goddesses included in the collector's line. She was a mythical creature and she was the daughter of gods and goddesses, um, but she's never perceived in the same way as the Olympians. So it's really interesting, in fact, that Barbie decided to include her as a goddess because she is the daughter of gods and goddesses. She is one of the mythical beings of ancient Mediterranean mythology, um, but she just wasn't necessarily given shrines and temples in the, in the same way that Athena and Aphrodite were. So personally I was just really fascinated to see that she'd been included and man would I love a Medusa doll. If anybody ever comes across a Barbie Medusa doll because they're no longer in production, go and hit me up because I need to know about it. I need her in my doll collection that I have. Yes, I do. So from ancient poetry to Renaissance paintings to modern day toy lines and video games, Medusa is everywhere, as you can tell. And well, she is but one woman or one Gorgon, shall we say, she has been so many different things to so many different people, to so many different cultures and artists and viewers of media that she is not going anywhere soon as far as I can tell. There's a lot still to be said and done with Medusa and Medusa's story and this has just been a little history of that as well as some of the major themes and interpretations of her character and myth that I find most fascinating over the millennia and the centuries. Hopefully you feel a little bit more familiar with who Medusa is, whoever that is, because um, perhaps it's impossible to really pinpoint who that is, as well as how she's changed over the years, how she became a monster and a femme fatale and how she is once again being reclaimed by modern day authors and creators. And I wonder where she's going to go next. There is much, much more that could be said about Medusa as well as many, many more adaptations and interpretations of Medusa than I've even been able to touch on here. In fact, there are various books, films, TV shows, games, and much, much more that I'm aware of. I just don't have time to talk about because Guess what? I've been filming for two hours and I have no idea how long this video essay is going to be. So I will link some further Medusa information, sources and media down below for anyone that's interested in just diving a little bit deeper. There's no right or wrong place to start, but remembering the complexities of this woman, this character, this Gorgon and this myth are always just really, really important, I think, when encountering her. So hopefully you have enjoyed this, my first ever video essay. It was a lot of hard work to research and film but also a ton of fun and um, it's something that I'm hoping to be doing a lot more frequently here on YouTube so let me know if you'd like me to continue with these video essays on a variety of different topics from antiquity to the modern day and if you have any requests for future videos then just let me know. I actually run polls over on my Patreon to help me pick which topics to explore next in depth including whichever one will be coming after this so if you'd like to support the creation of this content as well as vote on future video essays and get access to a bunch of other bonus content then please do head on over there if you've got a spare dollar or two it makes a massive difference um, to creating 
things like this and spending time on researching and creating things like this. But in the meantime, I'm so excited to keep talking about Medusa with you. There's so much more to say, so please do leave a comment down below letting me know perhaps what the biggest surprise has been to you as part of this video, what your favourite version of Medusa is, where you first encountered Medusa, because it could be in a variety of different places. And I will see you all again in the next one. Happy reading, everyone. Bye.